Tech, what can I say? Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the 2004 George B. Hartsog Lecture. My name is Brett Wright. I'm the chairman of the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for our 2004 lecture. This series began in 1978 with a gift from Bill Everhart and his wife, Mary, to honor George Hartsog, the seventh director of the National Park Service. He, a very nice gift from the Everharts, along with donations from his many friends and associates, is used to promote the educational activities of our department and promote the sustainable use of our parks and natural resources by honoring professional accomplishments that carry on Director Hartsog's legacy. We've established six awards that are given periodically, named, from out, named for outstanding colleagues of Director Hartsog. Four of these were given earlier today, and I'd like to introduce this year's recipients and ask that they stand as I read their name. Uh, first is the William C. Everhart Award, and it was presented to James E. Machuca. Jim, this was recognized for sustained achievement and interpretation that have illuminated creative insights to and fostered an appreciation of our cultural and historic heritage. Jim serves as the national coordinator for the Amtrak National Park Service Partnership, and he's done that since, since the year 2000. This is a program where interpreters ride Amtrak trains to promote the, the preservation and the, the use of historic sites in our national parks across the, the country. Jim, congratulations. Our second award is given for the first time and that's the Robert G. Stan Award that's given in recognition of inspirational leadership that contributes to increased participation by minorities in conservation in our natural, natural and cultural resources found in park and protected areas. This year, Robert G. Stan Award was presented to Charles Jordan. Charles? <laughs> Charles is the chairman of the Conservation Fund, America's National Land Trust, and has helped that fund and its partners protect more than 3.6 million acres of wildlife habitat, historic sites, greenways, wetlands, and open space. He's a former director of recreation and parks in Austin, Texas, and most recently Portland, Oregon, and is nationally recognized for his work and lifelong dedication to ensure that all of us understand that regardless of our racial or economic status and backgrounds, children deserve safe outdoor playgrounds as a matter of quality of life. Charles, thank you for all you do. Our next award, award is named after, or named in honor of Dr. Benton H. Box, the former Dean of Forestry and Recreation Resources here at Clemson. That was presented to David W. Tompkin. Dr. Tompkin, anyway, D David was, is, a, is a teacher here, he's is with Biological Sciences, and is the faculty advisor for a student organization named Tigers for Tigers. Since its origin, Tigers for Tigers has worked to save tigers in the wild by helping manage two wild tiger reserves in India. Dr. Tonkin has developed a course that incorporates tiger conservation with a trip to India uh, to study the tiger parks and the Indian culture. His next course is scheduled for this sp spring. Please, uh, even though he's not here, please uh, give him a round of applause, please. And finally, our last award is presenting to the person or persons who have demonstrated sustained achievement and public services providing leadership and administration of public lands and for policy formation affecting our natural, historical, and cultural resources. This year's Walter T. Cox Award was presented to both Robert M. Utley and William E. Brown, and they're in our front row. Bob Utley served for 25 years in various capacities with the National Park Service, but most Importantly, the chief of interpretation, he served as the chief of a uh, historian, I'm sorry, for the National Park Service from 1964 to 1972, which were George Hartsog's years as director. Since his retirement, he spent a whole lot of time writing books on historical uh, facts and historical research, and today he's published over 15 books on especially the history of the American West. I will tell you that as we went back to the hotel last night, uh, someone told me they turned on the TV on the History Channel, and they're... Uh, Bob was. So you might see his face uh, frequently after today if you watch the History Channel. Bob, congratulations. 
Bill Brown was a National Park Service historian as well and served under George Hartzog in the 1960s and 1970s and had a 35-year career with the National Park Service. He served as historian for the Southwest region and later for the Alaska region where he now resides. He wrote a book in 1972 entitled Islands of Hope, uh, Parks and Recreation and Environmental Crisis. And I will mention that books from both these individuals are out in the uh, lobby after this and uh, they'll be there to sign them if you're so interested. Bob, or Bill, I do appreciate all you do for coming so far. He drove up here, he flew all the way from Alaska to be here to honor George Hartzog. Please uh, give a round of applause for all of our winners. And now, without further ado, uh, the former, uh, formal part of our program. In previous years, we've had a distinguished individual that comes to give a lecture on the environment or natural resource issues. This year, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've invited four panelists to talk about the legacy of George Hartzog himself. The discussion will revolve around Director Hartzog's important contributions to conservation in the national park system and the influence that he has had on those who followed him, then the least of which are these four individuals. We are very honored to have a distinguished panel of professionals to so share their knowledge and their experiences with the director. Our panel consists of Bob Utley and William Brown, who was introduced as our awards recipients, but also Bob Stanton, uh, our 15th director of the National Park Service. He was confirmed in 1997 and served until the end of the Clinton administration in 2001, and he was the first director to undergo confirmation hearings before the U.S. Senate. And he's the first African American to serve in that position since the Park Service was originated in the, in, in the original act in 1916. Director Stanton is now teaching at Texas A&M University this semester, and I'm pleased to tell you that we are broadcasting this event back to his class at College Station, so I would be remiss if I didn't say howdy, Ags. <laughs> Gary Everhart was the ninth director of the National Park Service and, and came into office in 1975, and as director, he was instrumental in developing interpretive programs that focused on the history of the American Revolution in pre preparation for the bicentennial and was instrumental in increasing funding for park development. He helped shape what would become Alaska's National Forests and Parks um, at the end of the Ford administration. Gary serves as the Hartsog Executive, uh, Executive Council member and resides in Asheville, North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. Our first to speak will be Bob Utley. Brett emailed me and said, why don't you panelists get together and decide the sequence in which you're going to speak? I knew the others didn't care any more than I did what sequence we spoke in, so I put myself first. But I did this for another important reason. Um, Bill Brown and I were not big shots in the Park Service. We were little big shots in the Park Service. And uh, we of the Career Park Service especially venerate our former directors, most especially if they came up through the Career Service. So my reasoning went like this. Let's take the lightweights first and then we'll have the heavyweight second, and if I'm not mixing my metaphors, they can be the frosting on the cake. <laughs> well, I served uh, with George Hartzog during his entire tenure as director. I was not a member of the kitchen cabinet. I wasn't part of the uh, inner circle. I like to put it this way, that I was close enough to the kitchen to keep warm, but not too close to get burned. And so what I have today to say comes pretty much from looking through the kitchen door and uh, 
a few occasions when uh, I was summoned into the kitchen. I never got burned, but there were several times when I got pretty warm. What I would like to do with my allotted time is four, uh, make four points. And the first two of these are first to try to give you a sense of who this man George Hartzog was, and still is, but was, uh, as seen through that kitchen door and on occasion in the kitchen itself. To make George Hartzog for you, especially you students, more than just a printed word, uh, words on a page, which too many historical figures tend to be. So George Hartzog as a person, I like to say that he was almost an LBJ clone. There is so much in George Hartzog that was in Lyndon B. Johnson that the parallels are really striking. Uh, over the past uh, few weeks, as I contemplated this trip, I've been scratching down on a pad of paper words that I thought described uh, the George Hartzog that I knew. And last week, I received the first copy of my memoir. They got a whole stack of them out there. It's entitled Custer and Me but it could as well be entitled Hartzog and Me. But as I was reading it, and I love to read what I've written, uh, I came across a paragraph where in print were those words that I had been writing down for the past few weeks, which I shall now share with you. He was dynamic. He was a workaholic in the fullest sense of the word. And we used to laugh that those who wanted to buddy up to Hartzog would make sure they got at their desks before he came in at seven in the morning and they'd make sure their lights were still on when he went home late at night. He was a workaholic, he was dynamic, he was brimming with energy, he was tireless, he was overflowing with projects and purposes. He had one of the quickest minds that I have ever encountered. He was articulate in the extreme and still is. And the next few words I'm going to use are polar contrasts. And I think you can apply those words also to Lyndon B. Johnson. Urbane and crude. Open and devious. Kind and brutal. Caring, very caring, and ruthless, very ruthless. Gentle and hot-tempered. Those are the words that I put down that describes the George Hartzog that I knew during those eight years in Washington. Now I need to use three more words or groups of words to describe Director Hartzog. He was the boss in the fullest sense of that word. He was the very personification of the boss, and boy, you crossed that man at your peril. Politician, I have never observed, especially up that close, so skilled, astute a politician as was George Hartzog, working both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, the Capitol Hill, and the executive branch. Now, our former directors here will realize this truth, which most people don't. 
that the real nexus of power in Washington is not between the cabinet secretary and the committee chairs over on the hill. The real power is exercised by the bureau chiefs and the subcommittee chairs. The bureau chiefs control the money and the people. The subcommittee chairs determine how much money and how many people. And Hartzog knew that and he practiced it better than anyone I've ever known. And thirdly, as director, he was a visionary. He was simply overflowing with new ideas and new initiatives. So that's the man and the director that came across to me when I worked with him. I'm sure others have different perspectives. I know they do. Now the second thing I want to do is to give you from the historian's perspective and from the participant's perspective my take on the significance of George Hall Hartzog, the historical significance. He came out of the old National Park Service that had been created by Steve Mather and Horace Albright. And uh, he laid the groundwork for the new Park Service that evolved from that time forward. And so essentially the Park Service that you see now is the one that Hartzog created. Now that came about this way. The old Park Service was small. It called itself a family and in many ways it was a family because almost everyone knew almost everyone else. It uh, was ingrown. It was tradition bound. It was extremely resistant to any kind of change. Um, this was the Park Service that emerged after Mather and Halbright stepped down, and it was the Park Service of Franklin Roosevelt and Harold Ickes lasting up into the 1950s. Well, John F. Kennedy came in with his new frontier, and he brought in Stuart Udall as Secretary of the Interior and those new frontiers involve new directions, new ways of doing things, and uh, the Park Service couldn't cope. Connie Worth dug in his heels and resisted about everything that Stuart Udall wanted to do. And it all came to a climax in the big battle over whether there was going to be a Bureau of Re Outdoor Recreation or not. And of course the Park Service lost that one and Worth retired and Stuart Udall brought George Hartzog up way down here and made him director of the National Park Service, passing over a whole chain of men, men who had far better uh, seniority and credentials than he did but he was brought in to take that old park service and either get rid of the ones who couldn't change or transform them into a new park service. And so uh, George was very widely resented throughout the career park service because he hadn't paid his dues. Worth once told him, get, go to the end of the line and maybe you'll get up there someday. Well, Hartzog did exactly what was expected by Udall. And uh, I think that the right people came together at the right time in the right political environment for him to take the Park Service in those new directions and those new initiatives because you had LBJ and his great society in the White House, you had Stuart Udall and his environmental initiatives uh, in the Interior Department, you had the George Hartzog I've described to you, 
as director. You had a friend, friendly, responsive, democratic Congress. And you had a first lady who was willing to leave the White House and go out and promote these objectives. And I think Stuart Udall was the best Secretary of the Interior, even considering Harold Ickes, that the uh, nation has ever had. What were those new directions? I'll mention uh, just four. I think three is what he claims that he's proudest of. But of course, number one has got to be the expansion of the national park system. I couldn't remember the exact number until the blessing a while ago before lunch when the figure 69 was uh, uh, used and communicating upstairs. This included kinds of parks that the old park service had dug in its heels against, urban parks. That, to the purest, was not a true national park. Recreational parks, dams and reservoirs, those diluted the quality of the national park uh, system. New historical and archaeological parks that the old line park service went along with but really wasn't very interested in. He got the National Historic Preservation Act passed in 1966 and grabbed the National Register and grants and aid uh, that other agencies were after also. And so I include in the expansion of the system his tremendous mark on historic preservation. Another one of the non-conventional types of parks was the so-called cultural park, which ne never really took hold. He marked out new directions in park interpretation. He put a whole new face on the way the Park Service interprets, uh, interpreted the uh, parks and monuments. Um, some of these new directions I didn't agree with, and a lot of others didn't either, and, uh, and we opposed him on it, but of course he won in any uh, showdown. One another that he was very proud of was workplace diversity. Integrating blacks and Hispanics and women into the true National Park Service, not just as people, women who made the coffee or uh, blacks who cleaned the latrines. And uh, you will hear later in this uh, hour uh, from the first black superintendent named by George Hartsaw. Uh, and then the final one was Alaska. He really laid the groundwork for much that came later in terms of doubling, entirely doubling the uh, size of the national park system. But he was very much involved and I with him in those early moves up into Alaska. So he accomplished these things. And when Nixon fired Hartzog, the park service was launched in a direction in several directions very different from the old Park Service and there was no turning back from those directions. So I think that's the significance of Hartzog in laying the groundwork for the National Park Service we know today. Now there are two other points I want to make. Have I used up my 15 minutes? I'm going to make them anyway. <laughs> Number one, number one, he said to me repeatedly, tell me the truth. Never compromise your professionalism to tell me what you think I want to hear. He said, yeah, I have to have the truth in order to uh, make the right decision. And if I can't make it the way you like. I'll fall on the sword and not blame you. And for those of you who follow current events, I can't but contrast that approach 
of the politician to the professional with what we see going on today. Now, I had a great story I was going to conclude with, but I have, as usual, been more wordy than necessary, so I am going to let Bill Brown tell his stories, okay? Well, it's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed it so far. Uh, Bob, of course, as usual, covered the cosmos and uh, a, a lot of the individual chapters uh, of uh, what this uh, panel is about. And uh, I just kept uh, crossing off in my talk notes uh, but he did it so well that I don't even resent it. Uh, I'm going to start with a very personal anecdote. Now, we've gotten the picture that this man was a dynamo without a flywheel most of the time. And uh, things were churning at all times. There were new programs, new kinds of parks, new personnel relationships and directions, tearing up of all the old manuals, going cross-cut against uh, the grain of procedure and the way we used to do it, and so on. I was assigned one of, one of the zones where this, was, this churning was going on was in the field of environmental education, environmental interpretation, and environmental management. We had unleashed a, a, a it, it was like mushrooms growing in on a wet lawn. In the morning you come out and you can't help but step on them. And uh, we had all kinds of environmentally organized programs in the late 60s and early 70s that were part of that massive change. We weren't just managing scenery anymore. We weren't just a pleasuring ground group of parks. We were the models for sustainability. We, were, uh, uh, we had a controlled environment where we could experiment and do things right. Uh, we, were, we were pioneering in uh, a, a whole field of creating environmental ethics to save ourselves to save wildlife, to save habitat, and save the parks themselves. Well, George asked me to head a task force that would evaluate and assess the value of these many, many programs. Like I say, they, they just kept popping up during the night. And he wanted to know which of these programs were really significant? How they conjoined with one another? Whether they were compatible or no? What priorities out of this mass of effort, environmental study areas, the National Environmental Education Development, uh, outreach to urban zones, uh, what of these programs really counted? And how can we focus and concentrate so we don't just dribble away in an ever-increasing number of programs? All right, and I asked him if he would put a stop to new authorizations of programs for the time of the study. So we'd have a fixed moment in time, a cross-section uh, of, of, of what was actually happening. Well, between the inertial momentum of this creativity and initiative that he had spun and his own taking advantage of windows of opportunity, 
uh, as they occurred. Uh, the agreement that there would be stasis for the moment so we could take a look at what was happening all at one time. And, of course, people were taking the stew pot lid off and dumping new stuff in every day. And these new programs, uh, it was a big grant from the Department of Education. Well, one of the byproducts of this churning action was people got frustrated. They got exhausted. They, they, they would start and get halfway down the line to an objective, and the rules would change at mid-course, and uh, you'd have to start all over again. And uh, that happened to me in this task force assignment. And of course, being in the, in the center, in the, in the, in the, the, the throes of this uh, uh, task force effort, uh, I didn't have very good perspective. I just knew that we were getting overwhelmed and, and, and undermined. And uh, so we had a task force meeting. And in fact, we had a report. And I was the reporter. And I was complaining about these things. And, and uh, all of a sudden, my gorge just rose because I wasn't getting any favorable response. And uh, George Hartsog has related this story to me on many occasions. And he says, and I said, I stood up and I said, you are the dumbest SOB I've ever worked for. Now, I was mad as a hornet. But I don't think I said that. <laughs> I, I, I was mad, but I wasn't suicidal. You, you, you've heard that he was ruthless. I, you know. Um, well, when he tells this story, he tells it with glee. He slaps his knee. He, uh, he rolls around and laughs. And, uh, I don't understand it. I, 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 think it. I think he takes a perverse pleasure in having a minion who would uh, so uh, enthusiastically call him down. And uh, it, it's, 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 kind, it's kind of a, 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 a trophy on the wall that he, uh, that he went through that. And, uh, I, I just can't imagine that I said, you are the dumbest SOP I've ever worked for. <laughs> I just can't. But <clears throat> maybe I did. Uh, so I quit the Park Service. And I, I, uh, I did quit. I, I, I walked out. I, there was an anticlimax. I, I forgot my pipe. In those days, you'd sat around and smoke, you know, and, and clean the pipe and look wise and so on. And uh, uh, so I, uh, I got outside the door and I was just fuming. And uh, uh, I said, oh my God, I forgot my pipe. Well, this, I started toward the door and I said, oh, that would be very embarrassing. But to walk in there and grab my pipe after just having made this fantastically potent declaration to go in and get my pipe, but I did anyway. And there was a dead silence. And uh, George said, you might reconsider. And, uh, but I didn't. I stuck to my guns. And I worked uh, uh, for a year, and what I I, I, drawing the veil of charity, I, I call it my sabbatical. Uh, and I, I worked with Black Mesa Defense and the Mexico Center for the Environment, and we were fighting against those coal-powered, uh, the coal-fueled uh, power plants in the Southwest, which did exactly what we said they would do. They drove the uh, traditional Navajos off of Black Mesa, used up the water with Chinle Wash, so on and so forth. They uh, obliterated the uh, 
the clear light uh, with particulates and sometimes you can't see the north rim of Grand Canyon from the south rim. But and uh, uh, in addition to generating public meetings and so on, I wrote a book called Islands of Hope, earlier mentioned. And after a year I realized that these people, these conservationists, brilliant, committed, uh, sharpest tax in every respect, uh, they couldn't make a decision. They didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have a land base. They didn't have financing. All they had was persuasive tones of voice. And I realized something that Hartzog had told me earlier, that if you want to make a ruckus inside the tent, stay inside the tent. Because if you go outside, they can just roll down the flap and pretend you aren't there. And uh, so I, I wrote a letter to George. I'd completed my manuscript on Islands of Hope. And uh, I said, I, I want to come back to the Park Service. And I, I, re I related this, this business about the environmentalists couldn't force a decision. They didn't have the wherewithal to do it. And I related the idea that the land base is the reality. It's, it's what we can tie to. It's, it's what brings us home to reality. It's not abstract. And uh, he wrote back to me uh, a very gracious letter. He said, I always regretted that you had left the service. I wanted you all to stay on for some of the reasons Bob was talking about because uh, he tended to surround, to inadvertently surround himself with yes men because he was such a dominant personality. And he needed, he, I, that's, that's the classic definition of the isolation of power. And he knew that. And uh, so he invited me back. And uh, he, uh, when I sent the manuscript to him, I said, I've taken some shots at the Park Service here. Not, not out of uh, 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 vengeance or, or, or uh, retaliation, or anything, but because we did things wrong. We built the road in the wrong place in Zion, and I, I mentioned that. Uh, uh, he, he said, that's all right. He said, as long as I'm director of the Park Service, I will encourage dissent. I will encourage naysayers, because that's the only way that I can have a real sounding board. Otherwise, it's just an echo. Now, I think that says a lot about the man. And this exchange, this, this extended episode, created a whole new footing for my friendship with George Hartshaw. And I try to phone him oh, once every two months or so. And we have rollicking discussions. We uh, go through the whole cosmos. And uh, we, we enjoy each other's company. I want to uh, tell you one more uh, item, well, maybe two. Uh, Bob mentioned the LBJ George Hartzog uh, similarities. And uh, there is that story that when George went to Johnson City and to the Texas White House to help plan the LBJ National Historical Park with the president, uh, that LBJ said to George, he said, George, I wish we'd met sooner. He said, uh, together we could have moved the world. There's a footnote to that.
Oh, when I did the landmark studies for the presidential landmark at LBJ, I have, of course, found that great aggregation of sites birthplace, the boyhood home, the Texas White House, the ranch, the ancestral ranch, the old schoolhouse, the graveyard. I mean, any president in the modern era, whether he does nothing or she does everything, uh, is going to be a world historical figure, either passively or actively positive or negative. And so, of course, this was the ideal site. Nothing like it ever existed in any of the presidential sites. When I completed the package, I sent a blue envelope that's personal only delivery packet to George with a note. And I said, George, uh, of course I've given this national significance, but I don't believe that we should memorialize and, and uh, 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 monumentize active politicians, active uh, bureaucrats. We should wait 50 years. We should at least wait until they're out of office. And, uh, you know, this isn't, this isn't democracy. This is, uh, this is the trappings of royalty. Uh, George wrote back, he said, Bill, I appreciate your principles. I share them largely, but it just happens that the president has called me up and invited me to accompany him to Johnson City tomorrow. Something has to give. I believe I will accept the president's invitation. He, uh, he could, uh, Whittle a little bit on principle for great pragmatic reasons. He could give a little to gain a lot. I'm going to let it go at that. I, I appreciate what you said, Bob, about uh, the Alaska thing. Uh, his cultivation, George Hartsock's cultivation of the congressional whale as LBJ called them, as distinct from the minnows. His, his cultivation of Allen Bible and taking him, he was chairman of the subcommittee on parks in the Senate, taking him up to Alaska where he was just overwhelmed, overawed by the immense landscapes up there, uh, set the scene for the Bible Amendment, the National Interest Lands Amendment that charged the conservation agencies to study the outstanding areas of Alaska for designation as conservation units, parks, wildlife refuges, wild and scenic rivers, additions to forests. The greatest conservation act of all time the last chance. He knew it was the last chance. This was where the vision came in. There's no place else like the great territory of Alaska that was 99% federally owned. There is no concentration of great preserved lands like the wildlife refuges and parks in Alaska. More than two-thirds of the acreage of the National Park System of the United States is in Alaska. 80% of the wildlife refuge land base of the United States of America is in Alaska. That was a coup. I'll let it go at that.
Our next speaker is the ninth ex the ninth director of the Park Service, Gary Everhart. Thank you, Bill. It's uh, I can see why the historians went first, Robert. I think we got about one quarter of the time left to uh, tell our heart sock story and, and get out of here. Huh? Uh, I think the, the, the character of the man is, is beginning to take shape. A lot of things are, are kind of on the outside, I think, with a lot of people you see and you make, make trends, make assumptions, comparisons. But the real true character of, of George Hartzog is, I think, taking shape. A man that was compassionate to Bill Brown after he t <laughs> told him what he told him and led him back in the Park Service. And certainly, Bob Butley had a great outstanding career with the Park Service and uh, knew Hartzog like none of us ever knew Hartzog. Saw him day in and day out. But the character has taken place, a man compassionate, a man forgiving, and maybe I can uh, hopefully add a couple of things to that as to my experience with Hartsock. Most everything's been said. Bob Stanton and I were sitting there and said, what do we got left? <laughs> not much. Why, that's not really true. There's a lot of Hartsock stories. But uh, I want to say that uh, I stand before you today as, as one of the many that benefited from the policies and the initiatives of the Hartsog years. I came into the National Park Service uh, in 1957, newly out of, out of college. Uh, and at that time, Hartsog believed that people should be willing to, to move from one assignment to another to gain new experiences and to broaden their knowledge about parks and about people. And uh, if that's the way he felt about it, if that was the uh, services uh, uh, policy and they had good reason to believe that it would help one's career to advance, I was willing and I stepped up to the front of the line. And so several assignments later, I was uh, in 1965, I was in the regional office uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, serving as the division chief for uh, maintenance and engineering for the Southwest region. And it was a great job and even a greater place to live and work and to be associated with some of the greatest people at that time that, that uh, Bob Utley said, the timing was right. There were just great people there. They had come together, and they were ready to do things. So it was in Santa Fe that I met George Hartzog for the first time. And at the time, I was uh, being considered for another assignment to another region. And it was an offer that I was not particularly interested in at the time. And in order of saving time, I'm not going to go into those reasons. And Hartzog was in town to attend a regional conference and a dinner. And uh, I had been alerted by someone that, uh, in advance that di the director might want to talk to me about this transfer, which I was trying to wiggle out of. And uh, I was a little nervous about it, as you might, as you might uh, bet. I'm going to run up against Hartzog, this guy that Bob Utley has described for you. So I was nervous. But at the doors to this dining room, George was in the receiving line, welcoming him every month, everyone with his traditional handshake and his greeting, which was, Hello, my friend, how are you? I'm George Hartzog. And as Nancy and I were neared, he grasped my hand. Uh, he pulled me aside and said, we need to talk. And so now I was really nervous. And uh, 
But lucky for me, everything turned out and everything ended just fine. And it was not long after that little talk with George Hartzog that I was off to Yellowstone to the job of assistant superintendent, which was my first assignment in park management and what I had been seeking and one of the reasons that I was not interested in another lateral uh, uh, assignment. I recall this story because I think it says a lot about George Hartzog, about his character and his leadership style. There were in those days many career employees that had their career take a sharp turn from what they thought it was going to be or what they might have initially intended because he took time to hear their story. He took time for what so many of us don't do, which was to listen. He was decisive and he followed through on his intuition and he followed through on his promises, what he told you he was going to do. So he did not let the old ways stand in his way when it would benefit the objectives and the programs and the goals of the National Park Service. I never accepted the premise that some people made that uh, being mobile or meeting George Hartzog got me my first big opportunity, but like to think that somewhat like him, that I, uh, the dedication that I had, the hard work, the commitment, and the loyalty to the service was what turned the tide. For whatever reason, I will always be grateful to George Hartzog for that first opportunity in park management. And I found along the way early that it, you know, it's through the help of others that we attain our goals in life. And I've tried to help others and emulate George Hartzog in this respect. That first job in park management opened new doors to a rewarding 42-year career with the National Park Service. And I went on to serve as a superintendent of Grand Teton and had George Hartzog almost for a constant visitor every summer. I went on as the director of the National Park Service and the final 24 years of my career was as the superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway. So what contributed to George Hartzog's success? You've heard some of, the, some of the descriptive terms already today, and I think I agree with every one of them. I believe it in my own mind in many ways. It was because he believed in people and had confidence in their abilities. He was able to draw from them their best. He gave them the opportunity for full expression and he helped them develop and expand to their full potential. When he visited the parks or the field areas, he was always encouraging the managers and employees alike. He was giving them advice and urging them in ways to do their very best and sharing with them in their successes and lifting their spirits during the difficult times. When you had a foe to stand up to, George Hartzog would be there with you. He was always positive, optimistic, and upbeat, and he was ready for any challenge. George Hartzog is a people person. He loves people. Some of you may have had the opportunity. I know Brad has taken some students to visit George. He loves that opportunity and that feedback and that interaction and he loves being around people. I remember when he would visit Grand Teton, how he relished the all-employees cookouts, the potluck dinners, the, the meet-the-director the, meet the get-togethers, and being among the employees and their families. He was at his best form in these settings, always in his LBJ Stetson, and his western bolo tie that's been flashing here before you. Speaking for the many retirees and employees that share a special affection towards George Hartzog, we will always be grateful 
for the standard of excellence he set for the service and giving us the environmental ethic to continue the work to protect and preserve these unique and special treasured places for the benefit of future generations. <clears throat> George Hartzog will always be Mr. Director. He will always be relevant to the service and to its employees. We thank him for being there then, and we thank him for being there today. Thank you. The next. Next, if there's anything left to say, is the 11th director of the National Park Service. Pardon? How many? 15th. My gosh, are you that? <laughs> Just a youngster. <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, it's great to have uh, be here with these uh, former colleagues, and it's great to have Bob Stanton come forward and speak with you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, for that kind introduction. And let me just hasten to uh, thank uh, Dr. Brett Wright and uh, his distinguished uh, faculty, and certainly most of all the students who avail themselves to be with us this afternoon. And let me say howdy uh, to class R RPTS 689602 at Texas A&M University. It is an honor to be here. This is my second time appearing at this podium. I was here in 19. 97 to uh, deliver the Hartsalk lecture. So it's a great honor to be here at Clemson University, but perhaps equally as important to be here in South Carolina. Uh, Director Hartsalk is a native son of South Carolina, but also have a boss uh, who has been my faithful companion for some 38 years, who is also a native South Carolinian, my wife. So I'm humbled to be here on two fronts. I just want to applaud again the comments made by uh, Dr. Utley, Dr. Bill Brown, and certainly my dear friend, Gary Everhart, uh, for their comments about the legacy of George B. Hartsog, Jr. I first worked with the National Park Service as a seasonal ranger uh, before Director Hartsog became the director in 62 and 63. But I became a permanent employee in 1966 and served in four different positions during the Hartsalk years. During that period of time, I often sought uh, the council, and certainly I had the continued support of Director Hartsalk. But when I was, had the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor uh, to be nominated by the President, President Clinton, confirmed by the United States Senate, to serve as the 15th Director of your National Park Service, I again sought the council, the wisdom, and the guidance of George B. Hartsalk, Jr. And he offered me a thought, which I would like to impart, particularly with the students, those of who among you will become a director of the National Park Service, director of the state park system here in South Carolina, secretary of the interior, secretary of agriculture. I know that all of you have set your aims high, but I will leave you this particular thought from Director Hartsalk about management, and I quote, management involves vision, people, product, and money. Leadership is the mortar that binds them together. But there is something else very implicit in that wisdom and in that counsel from Director Hartsall, which I think has been implied by my three fellow speakers. And that simply is courage, courage. Director Hartsalk had courage to lead the National Park Service and lead the conservation movement in a new direction. But Director Hartsalk will also tell you that he derived a great deal of his strength, not only from his faith, but from his lovely family. Helen Hartsalk, his wife, his firstborn, George III, his lovely daughter, Nancy, and his son, Edwards. He was truly and truly is 
a family man, and that gave him a lot of strength. But I speak about courage. Just witness what was occurring in these United States during the director Hartsock tenure. Just think back, just think back. This year, 40 years ago, we celebrate what? The Civil Rights Act of 1964 that changed the whole social dynamic of this country. George Hartsock had to deliver on a National Park Service that connected the relevancy to many people who had not been privy to social facilities throughout this country. Next year, we will celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which too set into motion a new dynamic in terms of the relevancy of the national parks to a new emerging voting constituency. Director Hartsock was the man for the job. Bob Utley, Bill Brown, and Gary have mentioned about many of the monumental pieces of legislation that was enacted under Director Hartsock's leadership and guidance and his ability to work both sides of the aisle with Congress. Oh, he was a master, and he taught us well. But in addition to the conservation laws per se, he also worked with Congress to enact the Volunteers in the Parks Act. Today, the National Park Service benefits from 120,000 individual volunteers who give of themselves daily in the preservation of their national parks. He also worked with Congress in establishing, perhaps which is the legislation that gave me more interest and passion was the Youth Conservation Corps that allowed the federal government through the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service Bureau of Land Management to hire young people at the ages of 15 to 18 to work summers in the park, hands-on conservation, again, through the leadership of Director Hartsaw. He also introduced, particularly through National Capital Region, what they call Summer in the Parks, or Park Ball Season, to make sure that those who live in urban centers also have the opportunity to benefit directly from their national parks. That took a, a lot of courage. The other is Bob Utley and Bill Brown and Gary talked about. He looked out across the diversity of the resources contained in the national park system with respect to events and individuals who had contributed to the development of our country. And then he weighed that against the complexion, if you will, of the workforce and say, hey, there is a noticeable absence of women, Hispanic, Asians, and African Americans in the workforce, and particularly in the management rank. And I will tell you that I am very humble and shall always, always be indebted to Director Hartsock and looking out and saw my face and said, Bob Stanton, you will become the first, we called him then, Negroes, you will be the first Negro superintendent in the National Park Service. And ladies and gentlemen, that was as recent as 1970. So we have, in fact, come a long ways. And there has been a tremendous push uh, in terms of diversity and making the parks relevant uh, to all people. And that is a part of the George Hartsock legacy. Again, the point that Gary Everhart made and sort of likening to Isaac Newton uh, when he was about to be knighted uh, by the Queen of England. And many of us read about him today as Sir Isaac Newton. But as he commented in a very humble way, that if I have seen further, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. No person in the National Park Service today could ever argue the point that they have not benefited directly or indirectly from the George B. Hartsock legacy. His ability to work by, with the bipartisan way with members of Congress, the administrations, again, has taught us lessons well. The course that I'm teaching at Texas A&M is entitled National Parks, Lessons in Diversity, Environmental Quality, and Justice. And we use, as part of our required reading, the book, Battling for National Parks, written by George B. Hartsog, Jr. And notwithstanding that you're going to pick up Dr. Utley's book, I also recommend Director Hartsog's book as well. I know that the time has been expended. And I just want to ditto the comments that have been made by the three previous speakers. Uh, because I stand before you humbly recognizing that my indebtedness to Director Hartsall will continue for all times. He had an uncanny way of recognizing the most important resource available to him 
the men and women of the National Park Service. Again, as Gary Everhart, he was, in fact, a people's person. But he went further than that. He identified money that would underwrite new training, uh, frontline training, management development training for the employees. He introduced uh, new concepts of training our rangers to make sure that they had the necessary skills and they had to undergo training in urban centers. He inaugurated the first comprehensive visitor safety program in the National Park Service requiring every region to have a professionally trained safety officer to make sure that they're responsive to employee and business services. We could go on and on and on with a litany of the accomplishment of Director Hartsall, which really has served as the, the shoulders of the National Park Service uh, today. One of the words or the concept that we often use, which I think ultimately is a way that I think of Director Hartsall, not only in terms of his extraordinary professionalism, uh, his vision, uh, his dedication to the mission of the National Park Service, uh, his ability to work in the highest of the political arena. But ultimately, when all said and done, I think of him as a friend. Think of him as a friend. I belong to a college fraternity that has the expression, friendship is essential to the soul. A college roommate of mine told me that a friend is one with whom you can think aloud. But I would like to salute the memory and the embracement and the continuation of the George B. Hartsog legacy. In the words of the young president uh, who was sitting in the office at the time that he and the vice president appointed Secretary Udall as the Secretary of the Interior, who, similar to George Hartsog earlier, had diversified the workforce by appointing yours truly and roughly 50 other African Americans to work for the very first time in the National Park as Rangers. And I think this perhaps sums it up in terms of the friendship, the embracement of the ideals of George B. Hartsall Jr. I am certain that when the dust of centuries has passed over our cities, we too will be remembered, not for our victories or defeats in battles or in politics, but rather, my friends, for our contributions to the human spirit. Director Hartsalk has made his contribution to the human spirit. Not only we here today, but the American people are indebted to him. Those are the words of John F. Kennedy. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've gotten to see through a small window uh, a vision of a great person. And they say sometimes the mark of greatness is not what we do individually, but what we've done for the people that follow us. And gentlemen, I appreciate your love and your respect in helping us honor this great person. Uh, we have a reception set up outside after this. Please join us, and thank you so much for attending the George Hostock Lecture. <laughs>